One of the first things we need to realize that hepatitis B actually is the biggest problem in terms of infectious diseases in the Asia-Pacific region. And these are mortality figures uh, from the Global Burden of Disease Survey uh, not that long ago, showing that more than a million deaths, 80% of which are due to hepatitis B and 20% from hep C. Uh, and you can see that compared to the current uh, uh, um, issue of HIV and AIDS, it really is far surpasses that. <clears throat> So let's talk about endpoint versus goals. So the goals of therapy for hepatitis B are really uh, improving survival and reducing complications such as cirrhosis, liver cancer, and HCC. Um, but those goals take a long time to be achieved. So we need to have some endpoints along the way, shown here in orange, such as normalization of ALT, E antigen seroconversion, S antigen loss, to indicate that actually we're on the way to achieving these goals. <clears throat> And when we look at the endpoints of hepatitis B, there are many that we need to uh, look at uh, along the goal towards total uh, cure, if that's possible at all. On the far right, you can see the uh, goal of total cure of hepatitis B includes the removal of cells with integrated HPV and uh, both as well as the CCC DNA. So clearance of CCDNA is uh, not even the ultimate goal. So we have reached a, a sort of halfway point of an achievable goal of s adjunct clearance, which uh, is going to be called functional cure, which I'll discuss later. The trouble is that once uh, antiviral therapy has started, you can see in that gray bar over there, you can't actually tell what's going on in the liver, although viral replication is still ongoing. So we need some new tools to assess what's going on in the liver once you, know, you have started treatment and you've got to figure out whether your treatment is really effective or whether you need to take antiviral therapy long term, very much similar to HIV. <clears throat> so uh, if you're looking at uh, undetectable HPV and you need quantitative HPV levels, uh, E-antigen loss and seroconversion are important endpoint and that's usually measured off therapy. s antigen loss is, a, is a, a stretched goal, which I think is achievable. Uh, normalization of ALT and histological improvement are no longer uh, uh, utilized anymore because uh, nobody uh, tries to do liver biopsy with the, um, the use of non-invasive tools that have been superseded uh, liver biopsy. And ALT, there are many factors which cause ALT uh, abnormality and is not specific for hepatitis B. <clears throat> so I've listed here some novel assays that are used to assess HPV treatment endpoints. Uh, ideally speaking, the uh, intrahepatic markers are the best ones, such as total DNA or CCC DNA, but as I've mentioned, this requires liver biopsy, and I think uh, most uh, um, clinicians are moving away from this, so it's no longer a goal that we would like to use. However, for research reasons, we are still requiring to do liver biopsies so that we can understand what's happening to the virology and immunology in the liver. Uh, nonetheless, there are some serum markers which have become of considerable interest, such as quantitative S antigen levels. The current S antigen is qualitative, is that a positive or negative result? But you can quantify it with a simple ELISA methodology, and that gives some data on um, the uh, uh, replicative level of S antigen. Um, I've highlighted in red the, the, the uh, three uh, novel assays of interest, hepatitis B correlated antigen and HPV RNA. So correlated antigen actually composes of three different components, the E antigen, P22, and uh, um, uh, an antigen related to the core region of the hepatitis B. Now the trouble is, they're not exactly sure what correlated antigen measures. So it could be uh, more dominant uh, uh, on one antigen versus another in different situations. But this, um, this assay has been uh, produced in Japan, and it's, it's, there's quite a lot of data to, su su to suggest that uh, it does have some correlation to treatment response. 
And HPV RNA is also another assay that is of considerable interest. Uh, one, uh, five years ago, people didn't really believe that HPV RNA could exist in serum, but actually now it is found that HPV RNA can occur in, in encapsulated uh, uh, um, HPV particles in serum. So how do these correlate to uh, S antigen uh, um, response? So uh, to do this, we actually looked at uh, a study uh, of uh, interferon versus nucleoside analogs, either switch or add interferon. And uh, in this study, which was uh, presented at um, uh, easel this year, uh, we actually had about 16 patients with S antigen loss in about 100 over patients who had completed uh, uh, all the time points of the study at week 72. And when we did a multivariate analysis for prediction of S antigen loss, looking at the three markers we uh, looked at, quantitative S antigen level was less than 2 log at week 12, week 12 undetectable HPV RNA, and week 12 undetectable correlated antigen, which is the three antigens I mentioned. You can see here the odds ratio is the highest for the quantitative fast antigen level of 39, with uh, RNA being uh, an odds ratio of 10, and correlated antigen having the lowest. So the AUROC for that uh, quantitative fast antigen level actually is 0.96, so that's quite a high uh, um, AUROC for that, suggesting that Certainly, for interferon and nucleoside analog therapy, uh, quantitative S antigen work at week 12 is the best predictor of S antigen loss. So, moving on to uh, the definitions of cure. So, I know that HIV cure is a, is a very topical subject, especially functional cure. Uh, and so, there was a um, <clears throat> workshop about three years ago uh, in the U.S. run by Analog, where uh, most of the major liver societies came down to discuss what were the definitions of cure. And they came down that the best definition was a sustained s antigen loss of seroconversion 24 weeks of treatment with undetectable HB DNA uh, as a definition of functional cure, while absolute complete cure was probably going to be uh, hard to prove. Now, just some data quickly telling us that uh, um, if, you, if patients lose S antigen, which is the definite functional cure, they actually have improved clinical outcomes. Here, in a large study of about 5,500 patients followed over six years, a mean of six years, rather, uh, and the, uh, median, uh, the overall follow-up was 14 years. But patients with S antigen seroclearance in the blue line there had uh, almost 100% survival, but if they didn't have S antigen clearance, then survival is only about 80%. This is transplant-free survival. And uh, in the right-hand panel, uh, you see the same data, but here they're looking at uh, uh, cumulative incidence of liver cancer, and you see that those with S antigen loss have very low rates of uh, liver cancer, less than 5%, while um, in those who did not have S antigen loss, that rate was over 20% at 14 years, also indicating that S antigen loss is significantly associated with improved clinical outcomes. So can we achieve functional cure today? Well, this is actually a study of about 2,000 patients in Taiwan uh, by Professor Liao's group, uh, looking at just follow-up, no treatment, and they found that 45% of patients actually lost S antigen who were hepatitis B carriers over a period of 25 years. Now, it's taken 25 years to achieve that, and I think uh, uh, we certainly don't want to try and wait 25 years to achieve functional cure with therapies today. So the idea now is can we compress that to a much shorter time frame? But this study basically shows that the proof of principle that S antigen loss is certainly achievable in higher numbers of patients. So there are proof treatments uh, uh, available now. You can see on the left-hand panel, there are nucleoside analogs, and the right-hand panel are immunomodulators. <coughs> in red are the recommended therapies by the guidelines. Uh, uh, sorry, in orange, uh, entecavir and tenofovir represent uh, polymerase inhibitors which are uh, high with high genetic barrier while uh, pec interferon is still used today, but uh, not very frequently. 
Um, so what approaches can we use with the current therapy? And this is basically the spectrum of treatment options available today. One, uh, strategy one, you can start patients off with nucleoside analogs and continue them. Strategy two is combine nucleoside analogs. Strategy three is use interferon combining with the nucleoside analogs. Strategy four, switch from nucleoside analogs to interferon. And strategy five, surprisingly, is to stop treatment, which we wouldn't dare do in HIV, of course, but there's some very interesting data from uh, um, stopping therapy for hepatitis B. So let's look at continuing nukes first. Uh, and I just want to uh, uh, remind you that polymerase inhibitors have been widely available and is now considered the standard of care. I mean, you know, certainly for HIV, this is a very well-known drug with high safety record and a very effective therapy in terms of suppressing virus anyway. Now, since quantitative S antigen is a very important mark of S antigen loss, does the change in quantitative S antigen over time give us an idea of how uh, long we need to treat such patients before we lose S antigen? And you can see here that there are some patients who dramatically reduce their S antigen levels quickly and lose S antigen over a three to five year period of time after starting tenofovir. However, the numbers of these patients are really counted on one hand, uh, uh, so they're really very small. For the rest of the patients, modeling to suggest up to 40 years of nuke therapy before they are likely to lose S antigen. However, we shouldn't discount the utility of uh, nucleoside analogs. Uh, here is a meta-analysis, network meta-analysis, showing that e antigen seroconversion, which I didn't uh, mention or emphasize as a marker, is an important step towards uh, uh, the, the clearance or loss of S antigen. This, uh, this uh, uh, occurs uh, um, progressively with patients on nucleoside analog therapy, and you can see, regardless of which nuke they're on, you can see that it increases over time and maybe as high as 50%, even in lemividin-treated patients after five years of therapy, provided, of course, they don't get resistance. But when you look at the rate of S antigen loss uh, the six-year study from that Kim uh, Korean study of 5,500 patients, there's only 2% S antigen zero clearance. So it really is a quite a disappointing uh, uh, long-term result for functional cure. So we need to really consider uh, alternative strategies. So what about uh, combination nukes? And this strategy of intensification of therapy with combining nukes is being explored in a number of studies. The first one is by analog. <clears throat> And here, she used uh, antecavir plus tenofovir in patients uh, 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 randomized to either combination therapy with uh, 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 tenofovir or antecavir monotherapy. And when we look at uh, the table of results, there is a significantly higher pay number of patients with undetectable DNA, 80% versus about 70%. So it's about 10% advantage. But there's really no difference in E-antigen seroconversion or S-antigen loss. And in fact, the uh, E-antigen seroconversion rate is numerically high in the entire monotherapy group, which is a little bit surprising. Now, uh, this is a, a study done by uh, Henry Chan from Hong Kong, and in this study, they looked at patients with very high levels of virus uh, to see whether the combination of uh, uh, Truvada, tenofovir, and FTC was more superior than tenofovir monotherapy. And you can see here that after four years of therapy, it is indeed uh, clear that uh, combination therapy with Truvada is superior at suppressing HBV DNA compared to uh, tenofovir monotherapy. But if you look at that graph, you can see that even with the combination of therapy uh, of Truvada, uh, only about 80% uh, of patients have uh, completely suppressed virus. So it seems that in patients with high levels of virus, combined nucleoside analog therapy is not able to suppress virus completely. And there are going to be some patients where you're never going to be able to suppress virus, regardless of how many nukes you give them. So there's a limit to what nucleoside analog therapy can do in terms of intensifying therapy. It doesn't lead to improved clinical outcomes, it just leads to better viral suppression in some instances. So uh, what about using interferon and nukes? <clears throat> 
So this is a study, a uh, well-known study, uh, uh, published by Patrick Marcellin, looking at a, a combined study uh, of, of tenofovir and interferon uh, for 48 weeks in the light blue arm. <coughs> in the light uh, um, brown arm is a combination of PEG monotherapy alone. In the pink arm is uh, a short duration interferon therapy uh, with uh, tenofovir then followed on by 32 weeks of uh, uh, tenofovir therapy. So um, it was short duration uh, add-on PEC interferon. And in <clears throat> the gray arm is tenofovir monotherapy. You can see here that the combination group that has the best reductions in quantitative s antigen levels, uh, minus 1.1 log, and this has resulted in about 9% s antigen loss. And this is the first study that really showed that combined therapy was uh, clearly superior in terms of producing uh, a functional cure. And that's because uh, um, interferon has a different mechanism of action than the nukes, which acts on the polymerase. In this very uh, elegant study by um, uh, Ulla Protz's group uh, from uh, Germany, they found that um, Interferon works probably through two mechanisms, through the apoBAC 3 a uh, receptor leading to uh, deamination and a clearance of CCC DNA, but it can also work through the lymphotoxin beta receptor, also working on the apoBAC 3 a uh, mechanism, 3B mechanism. So uh, what about patients who are already on nucleoside analog therapy and, you know, they want to do something other than continuing on nucleoside analog therapy. Well, this is a, a, the PGAN study, which is adding, uh, nucleoside, uh, adding interferon to nucleoside analog therapy. You can see here uh, patients in blue had a PEG add-on, and it led to an 8% S-antigen loss at week 96. But unfortunately, uh, at the first year, the results are clinically significant, but second year, some patients who are nucleoside analogs actually lost as antigen, and that resulted in lack, loss of significance. Switching to PEG interferon was also explored in a, another randomized control study, OSST study from China, where patients with, uh, who are E antigen positive but low levels of E antigen uh, on antecavir for up to three years were then randomized either to switch over with an eight week overlap or continue in Tecavir. You can see here <coughs> in, the, uh, in the yellow, S antigen loss was 8.5% at week 48. So uh, does appear to improve uh, S antigen loss compared to uh, um, and Tecavir monotherapy, which had no S antigen loss. And the best predictor of that was a low quantity of S antigen of less than 1,500. So which one is better, add-on or switch to PEG? And, uh, the trouble with these two studies, the PGAN study was only e antigen positive, OSST study was only e antigen, uh, uh, sorry, PGAN study e only e antigen negative, OSST study was only e antigen positive, endpoints were at week 48 and not at the traditional uh, endpoint of 24 weeks after stopping therapy. So we did a RCT looking at uh, comparing the two, and I've shown you the study design before, continuing nukes or add-on or switch on to PEG, and patients need to be on nucleoside analogs for more than a year. So our data here overall shows on the ITT analysis, 11.3% in the add-on arm, 12.3% on the switch arm, uh, and the purple recall was slightly better, but there was no difference between the two arms, s antigen, zero conversion, also no difference between add-on or switch. However, switch arm at high rates of virological relapse and clinical relapse. Some of these patients need to restart therapy. <clears throat> so I think our summary is that uh, um, of, of all the interference studies that uh, de novo nukes and PEG leads to 9% estrogen loss. The swap study preliminary data showed no difference between the two arms as estrogen loss, zero conversion, but relapse is high in the switch arm. And I think when we look at the overall approach towards uh, nukes and interferon, uh, there's a limited efficacy of this. So an 8 to 10, 8 to 11 percent ascension loss, whichever strategy you use. So we really need to look forward to um, uh, uh, new strategies. Now, stopping nukes. 
was actually a, a very interesting finding in this study by Professor Hatsianas done about five years ago. Uh, in this group of patients that stopped at Defovir, 39% uh, patients achieved astringenosis, an amazing, highly high result. And they found that these patients had low astringen levels. So a number of studies have also explored this, uh, and I've summarized them here. Uh, one study by Henry Chan, another study from uh, Professor Chen in Taiwan, and here the, the, the rates of astringent loss uh, vary between the two groups, but you can see the sensitivity and specificity of astringent loss based on the level of quantitative astringent tells us that low quantitative s engine levels are uh, related to an achieving uh, s engine loss. But we don't know what is the current threshold, whether it's a below 1,000, below 100, or more than one long reduction in the quantitative s engine level. And further studies are required to explore this possibility. So we still don't know what's the best strategy. And to summarize this long-term NUCS uh, standard of care, can lead to improved s engine loss, but rarely as uh, E-engine serum conversion, but rarely s engine loss. Combination nukes provides no advantage. Uh, nuke add-on leads to a 10% uh, switch or the PEG interferon therapy leads to 10% high E-engine serum conversion, but 9% s loss only. And stopping nukes is an emerging problem that can lead to s engine loss, but patients need to have cold quantity quantitative as angina levels, and overall current therapies are limited in their ability to achieve functional cure, hence new therapies are needed. And I'm going to give you a very, very quick run through about new therapies uh, here. Uh, entry inhibitors, uh, Mercladex is now in clinical trials, sounds very promising, but reduces a viral load by one lock, hence unlikely to be able to cure it on its own. Uh, CCD inhibitors, Promising, but no drugs currently in, uh, uh, in preclinical or clinical studies. Uh, transcriptional inhibitors, uh, well, this is a lot of these studies that are uh, silencing RNA or inter RNA interference. Uh, this is an interesting concept where knockdown of RNA uh, hopefully allows uh, uh, immune recovery because it's, it knocks down all the viral proteins. <clears throat> Uh, Nucleocapsin inhibitors, another very interesting area. Uh, this class of drugs very promising, but likely to be used in combination rather than on its own. Uh, HBS secretion inhibitors, uh, uh, Replicor has got these very interesting compounds, uh, uh, and the intriguing and promising new drug candidates that's led to s antigen loss in a few clinical patients. Uh, immune modulators, well, uh, I don't want to go too much into detail about this, except that uh, therapeutic vaccines and innate immune modulators, which are being tested, uh, uh, we'll see whether they're effective. So far, none of them have been shown to be successful. And then novel inhibitors here, RNA station inhibitors, and FXR agonists, and cyclophilin inhibitor. Unproven. So, treatment strategies are likely to be needed, such as blocking viremia, antigen load, and CCGD, and stimulating immune responses, both innate, humoral, and T cell responses, in order to achieve functional cure. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, the new endpoint of chronic hepatitis B therapy is functional cure, defined as s antigen loss 24 weeks after stopping therapy. We have highly effective therapies that can control HPV, but rarely lead to cure. Current therapeutic strategies with nukes and interferon has limited potential to achieve this outcome. And new classes of therapeutic agents are promising but likely to be required in combination in order to achieve functional cure. Thank you very much for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Lin, for your excellent talk. Um, yes, we have questions, please. Very, very clear of you. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was just wondering that you, I think you, you were a little bit negative about combining nucleosides, um, but I did see an effect on, on the DNA. And uh, for instance, combining tenofovir by adding 3TC, which we know is not very expensive, no toxicity. Could you explore the potential of an additional benefit? of the combination versus? 
Well, the only combination that has been shown to have some uh, potential benefits serologically is telpivudine combining with entecavir or with tenofovir. Uh, we don't know why. Telpivudine seems to have some intriguing immunomodulatory properties in terms of E-antigen seroconversion. And there are three meta-analyses that have demonstrated uh, a 50% improvement in E-antigen seroconversion rates. So that's the only one that has been shown. Uh, but as antigen loss, it's just uh, not achievable with most nucleoside analogs in combination or, or not. Right, but, but then I, I think you, what the field is doing is they make as antigen loss like the golden standard. But I, I think that's also not proven to be. So my question is, I think you showed a slide that combining tenofovir and I believe it was 3TC increase your DNA reduction by 20%? Yes, negative DNA in 20%, correct. But it doesn't lead to improved serological outcomes. Now, having said that, I think these studies are not very long in duration. At the longest, they're three to four years. Uh, it's very hard to conduct RCTs for more than four or five years. Most of these studies uh, then become cohort studies. They all convert to the one therapy, and then you follow them for another five years. So we have great data on uh, cohorts of studies, cohorts of patients on one drug regimen, but not in a randomized control study. Right, so so uh, basically what I'm trying to argue for is, is to do a almost like a cohort type of approach where you randomize people to tenofovir and tenofovir 3TC, you follow them for 10 years, and then you look at antigen loss. Okay, so I think to answer your question, there is a study of that nature, which is the realm study. Uh, the manuscript is currently being finalized. I'm a co-author there, but uh, it's a safety study because this, this is the largest RCT. It's... Um, 12,000 patients, randomized to Entecave versus standard of care, uh, followed up in, I think, more than 120 countries. Uh, unfortunately, it's a safety study, so there's, they haven't collected serological data on everyone. So the largest group is in China of 6,000 patients. They have collected serological data there. So we wait to see whether there's any difference in s antigen loss rates. We have participated in a sub-study of that. There was no difference in s antigen loss between the two arms. Uh, there was, however, greater viral suppression with Antecavir versus standard of care, which is not surprising. Uh, um, but we wait to see whether in larger uh, studies that it holds to be true. Generally, um, I would say the answer is no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. you. Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Lim, uh, can I just uh, uh, ask one more question? Now, um, you said that um, it's quite difficult to achieve a CCDNA cure. I mean, this is the DNA curance. And nowadays, uh, we are aiming at, most of the time, aiming at the, the so-called functional cure by s antigen laws. Um, you also show us that some data um, that um, the Pegasus, together with Tenovovir, may be associated with a little bit higher s antigen laws as so functional cure. So is there any data showing that a prolonged combinations would have a benefit in terms of the s antigen laws? Yes, I didn't have time to show that data. There are studies on uh, PEC interferon extension studies going as long as three years with rates of s antigen loss as high as 30%. Now, I'll ask you whether any patients willing to tolerate weekly interferon for three years. None of my patients are, so I think that's not a practical option. And anybody who's used interferon will know that, you know, even 24 weeks is already... Uh, bad enough for patients. So asking them for three years of weekly injections, I think, is akin to torture. All right. Thank you. I but agree. of course, they can do that in China. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you.